Let's now move to our third story, biomechanics at planetary scale. Again, I was so lucky to work with the team, Tim Altoff, a graduate student, Rock, Yure, Abby King, and, and Jen Hicks, who were engaged in this project. And I present this on behalf of the, the whole team. We're motivated to study biomechanics at a planetary scale because after many millennia as hunter-gatherers, humans can now be observed primarily on comfortable seats in front of glowing screens. Indeed, there's a global pandemic of inactivity. Let me give you a few statistics that help scope the problem. In the US, approximately 260 million people are not active enough to maintain their health. That's 78% of the population, according to the Center for Disease Control. Now, the health cost of this inactivity is staggering. Min Lee and her colleagues reported that 5.3 million deaths worldwide each year are attributable to inactivity. 5.3 million deaths each year. Now, it's possible to make a calculation like this because there's strong evidence that physical inactivity is a risk factor for major diseases, including diabetes, six types of cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis. Sedentary behavior is also a risk factor for depression, anxiety, and dementia. So that's the bad news. The good news is that exercise is potent medicine. Let me just give you a quick example. A single bout of moderate to vigorous physical activity can reduce your blood pressure, improve your sleep, reduce your anxiety, and improve your cognition. So you can reduce your anxiety and improve your mental clarity by riding your bike or propelling your wheelchair. There's strong evidence that physical activity reduces pain from arthritis, protects your heart, and is an effective antidepressant. So this is a call to action for biomechanics. This is an opportunity. Now, the importance of analyzing movement is, of course, well known in the biomechanics community, including my own. We've studied movement with a variety of methods. Typically, in an experiment, we'll have people come into a lab, we'll analyze them, we might even build a, a 3D computer model that gives us insight. We'll ask people to perform precise activities with specific instructions, like running that I showed here. But now we have a new opportunity. Wearable devices, essentially, that much of the world is using. And the question we want to answer is, what can we learn from this massive, messy data set? This proliferation of commercial devices provides real opportunities, but also challenges. They provide a massive amount of data, really orders of magnitude more than we would get in a typical research study. And the data is from free living individuals for the most part, so it doesn't depend on self-reported outcomes or how they behave in a lab. So the big question is, how can these studies for using commercial devices complement our traditional biomechanical studies to deliver new insights? I'll answer that question with a focus on data with a smartphone app, app developed by a company called Azumio. Azumio shared with us anonymized data for nearly 2 million users of their Argus smartphone app. The app allows users all over the world to track steps and other exercises, weight, social activity, heart rate, and a lot of other things. For this analysis, I'll just show you data from a mere 74 million days of step tracking captured at one minute resolution. So there are about 100 billion data points that I'll focus on. We're really very lucky to have this connection with a small company, Azumio, that openly shared this data set with us. Now, the key research question that we attempted to answer is, does the distribution of physical activity in a population matter for public health? Because we have such a rich data set, we can dive in and not just look at average 
data sets. But can we identify people who are activity rich and activity poor? And do these disparities matter for public health? Now, one of the things we want to do when we have a new instrument, a new method, is to see if we can reproduce established trends. So what's known from studies like the NHANES studies, it revealed some important relationships between factors like gender, age, weight, and physical activity. So we wanted to see what's known already in these established trends is physical activity is lower in women, it's lower in the elderly, and it's lower in overweight and obese individuals. So we first wanted to see if we could reproduce those trends. And I'll show you the data here. So what you see is the average daily steps for different ages. You see that it declines with age. So here's uh, age 30 to 40. You get a peak between 20 and 40. And the average daily steps declines with age. You also see that males, on average, take more steps than do females. Now what I'm plotting here is the average daily steps in the US uh, here versus the body mass index. So healthy body mass index is between 18 and 25, and you see that's where the peak average daily steps occur, and it declines with increasing body mass index. So that was good news. We could reproduce these established trends. Now, we did this analysis and many other comparisons, and that gave us confidence that there was actually signal despite some of the noise you get. This let us characterize worldwide physical activity. And you can see these averages per country, and that's quite useful. This was the largest survey of physical activity worldwide by a factor of 1,000. But we have over 100 countries with more than 100 participants in the study, so we could go a little deeper. And I remember we were trying to figure out what how we should dive into the data, what question we should ask. And Yuri um, Leskovich was Tim Althoff's advisor, and we were all sitting around, and we worked for an hour or so on the whiteboard trying to figure out the question. At the end of the meeting, we didn't really have an answer. No good advice for Tim. And uh, Yuri made the bold advising move. He said, Tim, I think you should go off, meditate, and see what insights that you can get from this data. I was like, Yuri, that's really great. You're putting it on him. You have a lot of confidence in him. Let's see what he comes back with. And indeed, he had a really brilliant idea. And that was the idea of activity inequality. What I'm plotting here is activity inequality on the x-axis here versus the fraction of individuals within a country that is obese. And you can see there's a strong link between activity inequality and the level of obesity in a population. So what is activity inequality? Activity inequality we calculate with the Gini index. The Gini index is the same mathematical formula that we use to calculate income inequality. So if you have perfect equality, your activity inequality would be zero. That means that with zero inequality, everybody in a population, everybody in the country takes the same number of steps. At the other end of the spectrum, at one perfect inequality, one person in that population is taking all the steps for everybody else. So obviously things fall somewhere between them. And what you see is that activity inequality is strongly related to the fraction of individuals who are obese in the country. So for Japan and China, for example, there's low activity inequality and low levels of ob obesity, just around 5%. In the US and Saudi Arabia, there's high activity inequality, many activity rich people and activity poor people, and it's those activity poor people that account in general for the large fraction of a population in the US that's obese. Now, the activity and equality accounts for the fraction of uh, individuals within a population that's obese uh, much better than average uh, activity. So average activity has a R squared of 0.47. So the variance accounted for is, variability accounted for is just about 0.5. And with activity and equality, you do much better. 
So another question we wanted to ask is, when activity inequality is high, is there a difference between genders? And the answer is yes. So what you see here is the average steps per day versus activity inequality. So what you see is activity inequality as it goes up, it differentially disadvantages women. The slope here of the red line is less than the blue line. So as activity inequality is going up, women are taking fewer and fewer steps. What we found was that this was true not just in the US, but in many countries where activity inequality was high. Where we see this, it differentially disadvantages health outcomes for women. Whether there was high activity inequality, we saw this consequence in terms of reduced life years for women in those countries. So what are the key findings of this global study? First is that smartphones allowed biomechanics experiments at an unprecedented scale. For us as biomechanics people, it's a fantastic thing that almost everybody is carrying around a video camera, that's a great biomechanics tool, and a phone instrumented with an inertial measurement unit. That's how it coordinates the viewing of the screen. It also has an accelerometer and a gyro that we can use to make biomechanical measurements. So what a time for biomechanics. Second, activity inequality is a strong predictor of obesity prevalence and that there's a gender gap that drives much of this activity inequality in many countries. This suggests that interventions that increase physical activity could have an enormous impact a positive impact on health consequences. I started out showing the severe consequences of activity inequality, and this is an opportunity for biomechanics to have a substantial impact by providing a scientific basis for physical activity interventions. So that's my third story. I now want to move on to biomechanics as a global open science collaboration.